So who am I? This question is a very mystical question. Since civilization of men, we have often been looking for an answer to this mystic question, who am I? And we, we attempt to answer these questions <coughs> by pointing out the structure of I, bodily and mentally, the structure of I. But then there are many, many other questions that may not have brought, been brought up in your mind, which could be questions asked by many, many academic or philosophers, religious people. So what are these questions other than, or we already have quite an introduction as to who am I, but then there are some other questions that's related to, to who am I that we haven't really answered. If there is no I, because that's what we've been talking about, there's no ego. If there's no ego, there's no I, there's no self, then who is doing, why do we have to do this spiritual uh, practice? Where am I leading to? Uh, who is doing this? Is there any, any point in doing this? There's no I, there's no ego, there's, there's nothing about me, so I lost myself. I, I, where, am I, where am I going religiously, spiritually? Where am I going? Who is practicing? What's the point of practicing this? And there's the number one question that we really have to address this question. The second question is, okay, assuming there is no ego that Buddha's been talking about. Why is there reincarnation? What is reincarnating? Since I don't have I, I don't have, I don't, I don't have a body anymore, I don't have a mind anymore, I don't have myself anymore, there's no ego anymore. Who is reincarnating? Who is going through this reincarnation path? And who is responsible for this rebirth. What's going on? If, if there's no ego, suddenly there's a disappearing of me, so when am I going? How come I get reincarnated? What is this reincarnation? What is reincarnating? Have you got all these questions in your mind? Maybe you have these questions and maybe you dare not ask these questions, but this question seems to be challenging questions to ask. Don't worry about it. We try to we'll attempt to answer all these questions, but before we answer that, it's always worthwhile to know whether you really know about this anatta. What is anatman? That's a Sanskrit word. Now it spells A N A T T M A N. Anatman. Anatman means there's no soul. There's no ego. There's no I. One of the most major conception of the Buddhist teaching. So let's do it again. It's worthwhile because we've been talking about samadhi and vipassana. Uh, samadhi, zi, vipassana, guan. We've been talking about samadhi and vipassana. You know what samadhi is because we've been concentrating on the breath, we've been doing concentration, we can concentrate, we can focus on the candle, we can do many, many things in, in, in focusing our, our concentration. That is samadhi. Without focusing, without controlling yourself, if your thoughts are wandering in every direction, you can't even meditate. So you really have to focus yourself, you have to meditate first. Now that is a motive. We've been dealing with that and it seems that everybody understands that now in here, except that you are, you are a first time commerce, so you may not be able to understand, but you will gradually understand when you come a little further, when you come more to our regular meditations. Then what is vipassana? Vipassana is an insightful research of your mentality into the reality of the universe. This is one of it. Who am I? Then you are thinking because vipassana involved into analytical investigation. You need investigation. You need analysis. Who am I? This kind of investigation, this kind of analysis is to get into the reality, the true reality. So that's the reason why we have to repeat this all the time because you have to do this 
regularly in your, in, in your vipassana. In other words, you always have to think about it all the time. If you always have to think about something all the time, you really have to train yourself in such a way that it, you can easily visualize it. What is visualization? People have been teaching visualization. You visualize. When you visualize, you got to have concept, right? You got to have language and concept. Can you visualize without language and concepts? If you can, you, you raise your hand. I can visualize without concept. I can visualize without language. Without language, you, can, you can't even talk. Without concept, if we're talking about flowers, you don't know have a, uh, the concept of a flower. You cannot visualize a flower. A flower. So visualization and vipassana comes very connected to each other. So there's vipassana. So what we have to know, who am I, right? Let's repeat this as a review very quickly. And sometimes when you're meditating, you combine your samadhi with vipassana. You concentrate now, and in your concentration, you think more deep about reality. And that is the wisdom that arises from samadhi. Vipassana is to investigate, reveal a revelation of your wisdom. A samadhi is a revelation of your concentration. So you really have to work together. Let's talk about this. So we say, okay, we are, when we're meditating, yeah, I am a combination of body and mind. My body, internally, I got organs, which, is, which we put into this category, which we put into the category of body, right? We got organs, internal organs, with everything inside of us. You know them. And we classify them into 36 and sometimes 32 elements. The heart, the spleen, the kidney, the lung, the liquid, all these things. Uh, we already have gone through it. But then there are a few things that we have to specify so that we can visualize more clearly. And those are the salesmen, our senses, our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, and then our brain. These are the senses that we have to visualize. So we say, okay, so we are a combination of body and mind, body we know, all the ears, nose, tongue, you know, and our brain involves with the mentality of it, so we have a mind. All these senses create consciousness. Specifically speaking, in minute detail, even a body cell have consciousness. Just for the sake of crude consciousness, we identify consciousness of the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, all this consciousness. And all these consciousness create our reaction with the outside world. And in the, in the process of reacting with the outside world, we have concurrent mental functions arising. These concurrent mental fun functions are, sometimes they're good concurrent mental functions, sometimes they're bad concurrent mental functions. What are these good ones? You're compassionate, you're considerate, you have filial piety, you are cooperative with people, hardworking, you're intelligent, you have all these merits with you. But there are also the bad elements in you. You have jealousy, you have hatred, you have disappointment, you have envy, you have negligence, you have slothness, you have laziness, you name them. So we have all these concurrent mental functions. All these concurrent mental functions combine with our senses to work out every thought. When a thought comes up, if that thought materializes into speech, we talk it out. If that thought materializes into action, we act it out. And in the process of speaking and in the process of acting, obvious energy is being created. Energy, we call it energy. Don't you produce energy? If you say, I don't produce energy, then you're dead. You're a piece of rock. You have to have energy, right? You're producing energy. A thought is also an energy. Don't ignore your thought. Don't say that I, I have a thought of greediness. I have a, a thought of sensuality in me. I have a thought of promiscuity in me. It's just a thought. I didn't commit anything wrong. That thought is dangerous in you. You watch every thought because the thought itself is a latent energy, but it's got revealed and revelated. It's revealed that it becomes not just potential energy, obvious energy. Sometimes 
exuberant energy, but you're joyful, you're jumping around, exuberant, sometimes very latent, very reserved, very introversal, introvert energy. You've got extrovert and introvert, that's the reason why you have that kind of extrovert and introvert energy. So you know who you are because your body and mind. And let's throw away that word called religion. Throw away that call, that word called spiritual, which is spirituality. Don't talk about spiritual. Don't talk about religion. Do you care about your own thought? Do you care about your own speech? Do you care about your own action? Because you don't care, you get into trouble. You got to be very careful with every thought. Cultivate every meritorious thought. Cultivate every compassionate thought. Cultivate every considerate thought. Cultivate every thought that helps you to be successful. Cultivate every thought that helps you to be happy. Don't cultivate a thought that will lead you to sorrow. Why do people become so successful? Because they foster the, the their, their successful thought, the success of being interactive, responsible, hardworking, you name them. Which thought do you prefer? Watch your thought. You are what you thought. Every thought becomes what? If you carry it out, it becomes action. Every action accumulated becomes your personality. Your personality becomes your destiny. I hope you remember that. Throw away the word Buddha. We don't even have to talk about that Buddha. From now on, watch your thought. It's never too late. And then now, we put in the word religion in there now. So, you've been talking about actual thing, body and mind, what actually exists, which we've been talking about existence. Now we said we don't have an ego. Why do we say we don't have an ego? Because every one of these, who I, ego, when it works out, it combines with the concurrent mental functions and it carries out all this bad karma around you, around the people, people around you. You should know that every piece of yourself is nothing but a conglomeration of causes. You don't come up without causes. Your mom and dad comes together, came together one day, and fused you out in an embryo. So everything is causality. It's not without causes. So we finally have to disintegrate. And it's a combination of causes put together that we have us. And why, do we, why are the causes like that? Because of the karma created that put all the causes together. That comes out to be you. Remember when we talk about ego or self, it's a polluted self. It's a fictitious self. It's a forced self. And we cannot recognize that forced self as you. You cannot recognize anything fictitious, not actually existent. That's the existence of causes put together. You cannot recognize that as yourself. That is not your true self. That is the self that has been cheating you. That is the self that is polluted, that has been pulling down you down to suffering. That's the self that's responsible for what? Matrimonial trouble, your divorces, your broken families, your abusive behavior, your depression. That's the, 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 the ego that's responsible for a self that is not worth it. Do so you really have to purify that self to become a nirvana self, to become an enlightened self? So you cannot call this ego you because that is not you. That is not the real true you. But it does not mean that you don't have a you. But that you, when you arrive at a, at, at a level that is beyond words and conceptualization, we don't talk about that self anymore. We talk about higher level. It's beyond language, beyond conception. There's no, why do you still want to talk about the ego when you're already beyond the ego? Why do you still talk about kindergarten where you're already a PhD? The PhD can only tell the kindergarten children, work hard, here's a PhD level that you can arrive at. But the kindergarten would never, can never imagine what actually is a PhD level of understanding. 
But the PhD level of understanding understands the understanding of a kindergarten. So the PhD level can only tell you what is a PhD level. But when you are at the PhD level, why do you still want to want to talk about the kindergarten level? You still want to talk about the kindergarten, the self, the ego? So there's no ego. The ego is a combination of causes to get put together. And then one would say, okay, then fine. So what is responsible for this reincarnation? I don't have a self. Where do I go after I die? Where do I go? And then we, we go into this visualization. We have ears, eyes, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And then we say, what happens if we dial out the body? What happens if we don't have ears, eyes, nose, tongue, brain? No more. Where do I go? Now, we then, we then we have to go a little further because we're not talking about this life only. We have a next life where we don't get enlightened. So all these eyes, ears, nose, all this material, this material will include the, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your brain, all this perception, conception, and volition. It's your spiritual world. The material will die out. When you die, all these body cells gradually will disintegrate. No more bones even, only ashes, and, and later no more even ashes left. But then all this perception, conception, and volition that you have incurred when you're alive, they shrink into a storage, which is called a liar consciousness. They shrink into this banking consciousness. And this banking consciousness is invisible, it's an energy. For the sake of calling it, you must call it something and understand it. The Buddha called this is the alaya consciousness that you're left with. And this alaya means storage. This alaya means memory. This alaya means an acceptance of all good and bad and store into the same place. But it's invisible. It's a very powerful memory. And when, when you die out this body, no more thinking, no more perception, no more brain. It will shrink into an energy that is called a liar consciousness. And this a liar consciousness is your ego. But that ego is dead. It is still an ego, but that ego is a polluted self. The reason why the Buddha said, don't recognize an ego in here, because the Buddha said, the ego is the problem responsible for all the mental afflictions that we've been suffering. This is my, this is I, I got to protect myself. This is my personal interest, this is you. I want to possess as much as I can. I want to enjoy my body. When my body has a certain uh, biological or chemical reaction, I want to satisfy it. I want to have joy in, in sexuality. I want to have, to enjoy my senses, my eyes want to see pleasant things, my ears want to see... I want to, and to, to put myself in an enjoyment of all my senses. And that's what we call Epicureanism. Only satisfaction of the senses. And in the process of satisfying your senses, which is wrongly regarded as an ego, you incur what? You incur a lot of karmic energy. You kill animals for food to satisfy your taste of the tongue. You listen to all kinds of music that drown your heart, your mind, in order to satisfy your ears. You see all kinds of pornography, all kinds of things that you should be watching from anywhere to satisfy your eyes. You want to buy all the perfume, you want to be indulged in, 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 in smelling of your, of your nose. In other words, your ego wants impermanence temporary satisfaction. But in the process of doing it, you know what you do? You incur a lot of karma. You kill animals, you're greedy for your partner's treasuries, you want to commit fraud, you want to cheat, you want to steal, you want to lie, you want to curse, you want to do all kinds of things just to procure for your own possessions because you have an ego. Because this ego get us into trouble. And the Buddha, understanding procurement of an ego is dangerous to us, telling us that anatman, 
Don't indulge in your ego. First of all, get rid of your ego. Purify your ego first. That's the first step in the Buddha's teaching. If you can't even get rid of your ego, you continue to suffer. When you already can get rid of that ego, you purify your ego. You know what you got left with? You got left with, now I'm purifying my ego. Now I understand the Buddhist teaching. We should not kill, we should not steal. So we have a method. The Buddha told me to use this method to get rid of my ego. And this method is great, supernatural. This method is the best. And later the Buddha said, once you get rid of your ego, even that method has to be gotten rid of. No more views. No more obstinacy. No more attachment to views. You attach to Buddhism. The Buddha said finally, get rid of the Buddhism. Even that Buddhism is polluted. Even that Buddhism must be purified. In other words, the Buddha is telling us, we put in a lot of coats of pollu pollution. The first coat, the second coat, the third coat, we, we're, we're heavily cleared it with coats of pollution, coats of mental afflictions. The Buddha said the first coat is the coat of egoism, and that includes a lot of suffering and sorrow, that includes life, the, the death, sickness, aggrandizement of Oh, various things. Get rid of that code. So you get rid of that ego. And then the Buddha said, the second code, get rid of it. Get rid of the Dharma. The third code, get rid of even what has to be got rid of until there's nothing. For the sake of no term, I borrow a term, a nakedness of it. In other words, that's the true essence of it. But you really have to get bit by bit, get rid of all this attachment before you get to the core of the essence. In that moment, there's no more attachment, nothing. Sunyata, emptiness, complete sunyata. But this is the egoness you really have to first learn. If you don't even, if you, if you don't start with the ego, what do you start with? You got to start with purification of yourself. And the Buddha, thinking how to educate sentient beings to get rid of the ego. Yeah, three ways. First one, jie. Second one, ding. Third one, hui. Jie, I have to confine their bad behavior. So I have to introduce this vinaya, this sila. I have to introduce all these rules so that they won't commit bad karma. So thou shalt not steal, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit sexual misconduct. All these to confine the behavior, to change the behavior from bad behavior to good behavior. That, that's the first lesson. If you can't even do that, you'll be reincarnating in the cycle of life and death. So precepts, morality, that's the first step in your practice. And some people, even after talking about Buddhism for many years, they can't even follow the precept. They still kill, they still lie, they still commit mis sexual misconduct, they still curse, because they haven't even followed the Buddhist teaching, the initial basic teaching. So Vinaya, morality, is the first step. And then what is the second one? Samadhi. When you have the Vinaya, then you go on to control mentally. In other words, control your body first. If your body kill, your body commits sexual misconduct, your, 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 what you do, your express energy is wrong. Not to say your inner energy. First of all, control your express energy, your perception, your conception, your volition. Then you go to your inner self. But going into your inner self, you really have first have to first start with the focus. So you focus on your mind. That is samadhi. And then when you focus on your mind, that's not enough. You gotta have put wisdom into your samadhi. This is wisdom. 
So if you don't read, if you don't listen to lectures, if you don't read, where do you get your wisdom? Even if you don't read, you don't listen, sometimes you can contemplate the impermanence, for example, of the universe by watching the four seasons. How come we have spring? All the flowers keep sprouting out, and after a while, the, these flowers are impermanent, they all die and wither away, and they get back to the soil, and then oh, there comes autumn, and autumn, all the leaves fall, and then it comes winter. Winter, everything is, all the plants are dead. How come this always, always this impermanence cycle of the nature? And by, by doing that, you realize the impermanency, the wisdom of impermanency. That's Pratyaka Buddha. So sometimes by reading, by observing, by investigation, by analysis, by listening, you, you, you enhance your wisdom. So these are the three very important subjects, very important practices you have to go through in order to get to Nirvana. Morality, Samadhi, and Vipassana. That's what you've been learning now. This half an hour ago, I started Vipassana, that's the Vipassana. That is the wisdom you have to induce in your thinking. If you always think about this, you more or less is purified in your latent energy because you know how to do Vipassana. You, don't, you know how to do insightful contemplation.